my name is Morgan and I am a neuroscience researcher and welcome to my first video in a while. Today we are going to be doing a reaction to a highly requested Big Bang Theory episode. But first I wanted to say a couple of things, or really one main thing. So you may have noticed that in a previous Big Bang Theory episode I mentioned that I strongly support the LGBTQIA community. And then I was magically silent for all of Pride Month, and I think it's very fitting that this is coming out on the last day of Pride Month. So not only do I support the LGBTQIA plus community, I am a member of them. I'm wearing my rainbow shirt today and my little rainbow hat. You can check out my TikTok for more information on that. I've been posting on there nearly daily this month in a lot of Pride related content. And I had really wanted to do some pride themed videos this month, but this is a neuroscience channel and the LGBTQIA plus community has kind of a rocky history with neuroscience at best. And I would definitely love to talk about that in another video. I do plan to do a video at some point talking about uh, like gay and transgender brains because there's been a lot of research done on that. However, a lot of that history can be somewhat traumatizing. And during Pride Month, I wanted to keep everything positive. I wanted to be very positive and supportive of the LGBTQIA plus community. And I didn't want to put out anything that with that dark of a history during this month. So you can bet I will definitely be talking about it at some point, but I didn't think it was fitting for this month. And so I thought rather than posting negative content or unrelated content, it would just be better to not say much. I had also talked to some people and really wanted to do a video talking about like queer neuroscientists because I thought that would be a great way to talk about neuroscience during Pride Month. Like different people who have made amazing discoveries about the brain who happen to be a member of the LGBTQI plus community. However, in a similar situation to how women have been consistently kicked out of science, um, members of the LGBTQIA plus community have also, and therefore we don't have as many um, historical figures who were members of the LGBTQIA plus community. Hopefully in the future that changes and I'll be able to make a really solid video on it. But like I said, it is the last day of Pride Month. I still wanted to put something out there and you guys seem to really enjoy my Big Bang Theory videos. So here's a Big Bang Theory video. I also thought that this would be a great one to react to because it is not necessarily neuroscience related, but a lot of people have been requesting it, saying that this episode is about Sheldon and Leonard trying to get more women involved in STEM, more young girls involved in STEM. And as I have hopefully made very clear on this channel, that is something I am extremely passionate about. I would love to increase both like our knowledge of the female brain and having more women and girls in science. And unlike the other episodes that I've reacted to where I sort of like, I may or may not have seen them. I don't fully, like I don't have the greatest memory. I don't remember every single Big Bang Theory episode that I've seen, um, but I probably did see those at some point. I can confidently say that I've never seen this episode. So today we're reacting to season six, episode 18, The Congra Contractual Obligation which theoretically is about Leonard and Sheldon trying to get girls involved in STEM. Like I do for all of my reaction videos, in order to uh, avoid any copyright issues, I will be cutting out any parts of the episode that don't have something to do with science. That way I'm not just putting the full episode out there. All right, I'm using earbuds this time because uh, my headphones broke um, and my screen's over here. So let's get to it. Look, I know you guys don't want to do this, but we have no choice. So you can either bitch and whine or we can just get it over with. I got wine. I got the B word. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that or not, but it is thundering outside. I'm sorry, I don't control the weather. I really need to record this today. So if you hear background storm sounds, that's what that is. Yeah, well, it's in our contract to serve on a university committee, and frankly, this is one I believe in. Okay, here we go. Encouraging more women to pursue a career in the sciences. Come on. Here's a fun fact about women in STEM and some of the issues that we face. Uh, he mentioned committees. A lot of faculty members are expected to serve on committees, but actually studies have shown that women are expected to serve on more committees than men, even whenever they have the same qualifications and the same position. On, if I was any good at convincing women to do stuff, I wouldn't have spent so much of my 20s in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask me, this whole thing is a waste of our time. Helping women? Yeah, helping anyone. <laughs> At least it's equal opportunity, you know? People should take care of themselves. 
Oh, like yesterday when you made me drive you to the dry cleaners, the pharmacy, and the post office? I'm not saying people can't use tools. <laughs> Hell, even an otter picks up a rock when he wants a clam. You don't think it's worthwhile to try to get more women working in science? Yeah. I think that's incredibly sexist of you. I believe in a gender-blind society, like in Star Trek, where women and men of all races and creeds work side by side as equals. You mean where they were advanced enough to invent an interstellar warp drive, but a black lady still answered the space phone? You know, in a previous video, I said something about, like, the Big Bang Theory making, like, sexist and homophobic comments, which I still stand by, but thank you to the people who recommended this, because, you know, that was a good point. That was solid, yeah. Oh, I did spend a lot of my shower time with Lieutenant Uhura. <laughs> Howard's disturbing recollections aside, I don't appreciate being forced to do banal committee work. Yes, I know. You're too smart for this. Exactly. It's like asking the human torch to heat up your frozen burrito. Got it. All right. I'm thinking one way to counter bias in the peer review process is for papers to be submitted under gender neutral names like S. Smith instead of Samantha Smith. I suppose there is a history of professional women using their initials so as not to be prejudged. Harry this is one of my big issues, and you know, I kind of agree with what he's saying here because again, studies have shown that if you have a feminine sounding name, you are less likely to get your grant funded, you are less likely to get the position you're applying for, etc. If you have a gender neutral or a masculine sounding name, you'll do better in those processes. Here's my thought is like, why do we need to put names on it? You could, in a lot of application processes, like for colleges and for scholarships and stuff, they'll assign you a number or they'll assign you a letter. But whenever we apply for grants or whenever we submit papers, we have to put our name on it. And that just, not only does it encourage the gender bias, but it also encourages other biases such as labs from Harvard are more likely to get published than smaller labs. Or someone who is already well known in the field is more likely to get published than someone who is lesser known in the field, even if they're doing the same work. So why can't we just assign people either like numbers or letters during the application process? I've never understood the need to retain that system. <laughs> Guys, our topic is encouraging women in science. Can you at least play a less sexist game? How is it sexist? Well, my character wields a battle axe as well as any man. <laughs> Not to mention she has memory glands that could nurse a family of 30. Have enough milk left over to open a Baskin Robbins. <laughs> Mother, warrior princess, franchise owner, I your glass ceiling shattering all over town. Sheldon, you're always saying how much smarter you are than me. Spend five seconds and come up with one idea on how to get more women into science. Okay, here's my deal: is that even in an episode where they're talking about encouraging women to get into science they're still making like a lot of really sexist jokes, which is not great. I, as a scientist, am very uncomfortable with referring to women's chest areas as memories that could feed a family of 30 or whatever he said. Just inappropriate and unnecessary. Like, there's clear bias in the field, which I think they are doing an okay job of pointing out. So why do you have to also make sexist comments? I'm, all your ideas address the issue at a university level. By then it's too late. You need to design an outreach program that targets girls at the middle school level and sets them on an academic track towards the hard sciences. That's actually good. Why didn't I think of that? Here's my big issue with all of these conversations, not even in particular the Big Bang Theory, like a lot of people make this mistake, is that the issue isn't necessarily getting women and girls involved in STEM or getting them interested in STEM. We're interested in STEM at the same rate as boys or men. The issue is the discrimination that we face, and by encouraging more women, you're not preventing the discrimination. Even in my field in neuroscience, so um, neuroscience at the graduate level is actually about 51 or 52% female or women 
However, whenever you look at um, PIs, people who are in charge of labs, or uh, people who are getting more funding, or people who are on committees, people who are hiring, people like in the higher levels of science, it is majority male. So that shows clearly at a minimum an even amount of women are interested in neuroscience. However, there is that leaky pipeline that is preventing us from advancing to the higher levels. So it's clearly not an issue with women being interested in STEM. It's an issue with those preventing us from advancing in STEM. However, also now that I'm thinking about it, this episode did come out a while ago, so we may not have had that data yet. And it is still doing a good job of describing some of the issues that women face in STEM so far. I wonder if there's a way we could give the idea a trial run. Maybe I could call my old middle school, see if we can talk to some of the female students. Yeah, that's great. Try to set up something for the three of us to go over there. Oh, hold on. Well, I'm comfortable speaking about science. I'm not sure I know how to spark the interest of school children. Better go. Um, avoiding the statement that's about to be made. Um, a great way if you're interested in doing outreach work is to get in contact with your old high school or your old middle school. Oftentimes they're looking for ways to sort of vary um, the education that their students are getting and sort of help get people more interested. So if you are in science and you're interested in finding a way to do some outreach, a great way to do outreach is to reach out to your old school. Okay, who's ready for some science? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, I am Dr. Leonard Hofstetter. I am here with my friends, Dr. Cooper and real life astronaut, Howard Wallowitz. And we are going to show you girls how cool a job in science can be. How cool you ask? Well, how about negative 273 degrees? Cause that's the temperature at which entropy reaches its minimum value. I want to say, oh wow, that's really cringy that we didn't get anyone interested in science, but also I've interacted with enough scientists in my life to know that's exactly how this would go down if you invited some of them to talk to a school. Did I just learn something new and have fun doing it? What? <laughs> All right. So now let's bring out theoretical physicist, Dr. Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> At least they seem to be talking to like an older age range. I have seen scientists go up to like kindergartners or like first graders and try to explain like the complexities of what we do. Like phys theoretical physicists, that's like a third grader doesn't even know what physics is, um, so at least they're talking to sort of like an older crowd, so maybe they'll like kind of get it. There are ways to break down your science in a way that younger people can understand, just scientists tend to not be great at it. Hello, female children. <laughs> Allow me to inspire you with a story about a great female scientist. Polish-born, French-educated, Madame Curie. Co-discoverer of radioactivity, she was a hero of science. Until her hair fell out, her vomit and stool became filled with blood, and she was poisoned to death by her own discovery. That's not great. Like, that's a clearly not a great way to get people interested in science. But also, I ran into this issue whenever I was making my women in science videos. It is kind of difficult because we've been shoved out of science for so long to talk about anything that a woman did in a, a positive way that doesn't end in their death or something bad happening to them. And once again, that's not an issue with women who are in science. That's an issue with the system in which we exist and the fact that we're so frequently pushed out of science. With a little hard work, I see no reason why that can't happen to any of you. Honestly, that's played for laughs, but scientists really do give our lives to our work. Like, it, most of us would be not happy because no one wants to die, but like, you know, kind of like a hero's death. The thing to remember is you can go to outer space too. <laughs> I mean, look at me. 
I went to this very school. Those desks you're sitting in? This is funny because I don't know if this came out, like, yeah, I don't know timelines of things, so I don't know exactly when this came out. But there was, like, that all-female uh, spacewalk that was supposed to happen, and then they just, like, didn't send up enough women's suits. Um, so maybe, <laughs> maybe they could go to space, they couldn't just, like, walk in space, you know? It's fine, I'm not bitter about it. I was once super glued to one of them. <laughs> Did you go to the moon? No, but I did go to the International Space Station. Did you fly the rocket? No, but I was in the rocket. I didn't actually... So you just flew around? It's kind of like my uncle. He's a flight attendant. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm an American hero. Your uncle brings people nuts, okay? All right, all right, all right. Boy, we are learning a lot here, huh? I'm not here for this flight attendant uh, slander. Not great. Um, also, though, this is one of the difficulties of doing outreach events, and so I kind of I feel it in my soul. Um, wherever you're doing outreach events, oftentimes like kids will ask you questions like you're either unprepared for or like you don't know how to properly answer, or you have a really disappointing answer for them. That's my least favorite thing is wherever a kid asks you a question and the answer just like makes them sad. It's upsetting. One time I brought like a rat brain to an event and this kid like looked at me and she was like, oh, is that real? And I was like, yeah, isn't that so cool? And she started crying. So, um, so our events can be tough. Thank you, astronaut Howard. <clears throat> um, I am what's called an experimental physicist, which is super fun because I get to test theories and work with lasers. Yes? How did you decide to become a scientist? Oh. Excellent question. Um, I suppose I've always been into science. My mother and father are scientists, so I was kind of led in that direction. Uh, pushed might be a better way to describe it. <laughs> okay, I have two things. Uh, first of all, working with lasers sounds a lot cooler than it is. Technically, I'm certified to work with lasers, but it's just like, lasers aren't what you're thinking of. It's not as cool as what you're thinking. It's actually kind of boring um maybe his physics lasers are cooler than my like neuroscience lasers but uh just want to put that out there the other thing is like yes there are a lot of people who go into science because their family has been in science uh, i always relate it back to their like families of lawyers and families of medical doctors so of course there are families of scientists um but i am a first generation student and it was always tough for me hearing that because people make these connections like they're they're born with these connections that you don't have and you have to form yourself or one of the big things that I've seen people run into is learning how to join a lab. If your parents are scientists, they can tell you how to reach out to a lab and how to join one. I have a video on how to join a lab, but I can't sit there and walk you through it. And I didn't have anyone to walk me through it, so I had to go by trial and error. I'm sure I sent a lot of really weird emails to a lot of people, and I'm sure they were very confused by what I was trying to ask them. I know that was kind of a tangent, but my point is, even though there are a lot of people who were like born into becoming a scientist, it is possible to get into it even if you're first gen. I, I did it. If you have questions or would like help with anything, my Instagram DMs are open. My TikTok DMs I think are open. I don't know how to open those. Um, and also my comment section. I would love to help out more first gen students. Be honest with you guys, when I was your age, I wanted to be a rap star. <laughs> like Snoop Dogg, but with a healthy respect for the police. <laughs> No. Yeah, I'm not sure you laugh. <laughs> Just like my mother did. <laughs> After I confided, I was derided and chided. My mom and I collided. Why? <laughs> that was painful. Um, I don't really have much to say on that. She said my dreams were misguided. <laughs> Just a little freestyle. I never wanted to play the cello. <laughs> how do you how do you meet girls playing the cello? Hey. He's just gone into like a, a therapy session with these children. <laughs> Not great. I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but during outreach events, you always want to be as professional as possible. Bumblebee. <laughs> Quick, pull the fire alarm. Let's get out of here. <laughs> Uh, hello again. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know if women in general have been actively discouraged from pursuing the sciences, but uh, it's clear you young women here today have been. Okay, first of all, yes, there are a lot, a lot of studies and personal experiences of women in STEM, myself included, um, that show that women are discouraged from being in STEM. It's not that we don't have a natural curiosity for it, it's that from the moment that we enter education and even sometimes amongst our own family, we are discouraged from pursuing sciences or technology, engineering, math, any of those. But also, yes, if I saw this presentation and I thought that's what scientists did, I might not be where I am today, honestly. While I was listening to my colleagues waste your time, it occurred to me that it might be much more meaningful to hear about women in science from actual women in science. And uh, I happen to know two brilliant examples who have agreed to speak to you on the phone right now. Uh, Doc that's a great solution. Really, women mentoring other women has been shown to help with retention of women in sciences. So having a female mentor or uh, someone who is helping you who is of the same gender as you, particularly for women, has been shown to help them. Dr. Rostenkowski, Dr. Fowler, are you there? We're here. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to enlighten these young women. It's our pleasure. <laughs> to explain this, there was a whole B-plot where they're at Disney World, so they got princess makeovers. I'm Dr. Fowler, and I'm a neuroscientist. And I'm Dr. Rostenkowski Wallowitz, and I'm a microbiologist. The world of science needs more women, but from a young age, we girls are encouraged to care more about the way we look and about the power of our minds. <laughs> That's true. That is a true statement. I was told from a very young age that if I was too intelligent, boys wouldn't want me and I wouldn't be able to find a husband. So, yeah, like I was saying, it, it starts really young. Every one of you has the capacity to be anything you want to be. All right, so that was like, that was the whole episode. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed this and me ranting on about how women are discriminated against in STEM. I have several other videos on my channel talking about that same issue. Thank you so, so much to everyone who recommended this episode to me. It was actually really great and has somewhat redeemed my opinion of the Big Bang Theory as a whole. Like I've said many times, you know, I understand that it's a show for comedic purposes, but you clicked on a video saying Neuroscientist Reacts. I reacted. If you have any other episodes that you would like for me to react to, or any um, videos maybe on YouTube that you'd like for me to react to, or just general neuroscience topics that you would like for me to cover, please feel free to leave them in a comment below. You can also email me at askaneuroresearcher at gmail.com, and you can find me on all my social medias. Like I said at the beginning, I've been a lot more active on TikTok lately, so if you want to see sort of like daily lives and my opinions of things other than neuroscience, that would be a great place to follow me. Uh, I post a lot of lab-related content on my Instagram. Instagram stories, just go follow me on all the socials. And with all that, I hope you have a great day and I will see you in two weeks, maybe. We'll see if I can keep a consistent upload schedule. Bye.